Good evening, everybody. Um, the context for House Divided uh, is a housing affordability crisis, um, a crisis that threatens to put life in the city out of reach of more and more households now extending well into the middle class. The context is a quality of life crisis where we spend too much time traveling place to place in a region that is underinvested in transit while it sprawls outwards and has put most of its economic eggs in one central basket. Um, the context is uh, an environmental crisis, uh, accelerating climate change and the need to live closer together uh, on a smaller footprint. And yet, uh, in much of the residential, low-rise residential land area in the city, it is impossible or exceedingly difficult to house more people in more affordable housing types um, and make more efficient use of land. Now, this isn't a conversation that's limited to Toronto. Uh, this is a conversation that's taking place in cities across Canada and across North America as uh, we look at land use restrictions that date back a century and post-war urban structures and revisit and question how they uh, stand up to the challenges we face today. Um, and it's really part of the overarching uh, conversation about quality inequality, so the conversation about spatial inequality. Now, I just want to say that the 69 aspect ratio is really good for me. So, um, <laughs> aside, on the topic of spatial inequality, uh, the book uh, House Divided mentions the yellow belt frequently. Um, what is the yellow belt? Now, uh, a broad definition would be uh, low rise residential neighborhoods where neighborhood scale intensification is either uh, impossible or completely difficult. There are zoning related approaches to the yellow belt and official plan related. Uh, the yellow yellow belt is the residential attached zone. This alone accounts for about a third of the land area of the city. Um, but I actually think that underplays it because you're not building housing in parks, you're not building housing in employment lands, you're not building housing in utility areas. Uh, in terms of what that represents as part of the residential permitted land area of the city, uh, it's over 50%. You could add on the semi-detached, the residential townhouse, and you have the yellow belt that uh, really exclusively permits uh, single-family home types. And then there are the RN and R zones. So these are the more permissive zones that relate to and around the old city of Toronto, where ostensibly you can build duplexes and triplexes and walk-up apartments. Um, I personally would include those in the yellow belt because in many instances, whether it's a function of density emissions or a function of building depth or a function of other zoning related restrictions, you can't necessarily realize the form that uh, is permitted and that the, is the use, permitted use requires. Um, and in terms of how I think about the yellow belt, those five zoning designations are the ones that align with uh, the neighborhood official plan designation. So this is the official plan, land use structure, and if you took everything else away, you get to your neighborhoods. Um, the neighborhoods are where the yellow belt conversation began. This, this was the first map circulated as, uh, as the yellow belt. And the reason I would start here is, is twofold. It's, uh, we have a hierarchical planning structure, and uh, the official plan provides division, and the zoning bylaw provides precision, and you need to have division straight before you can start working on the other. Uh, and secondarily, it's the language of neighborhoods around stable physical character that can really be wielded, and has been wielded, um, as a brush that can paint out other uses other than houses. Uh, it's the language around uh, determined physical character in terms of the most frequently occurring form of development. Even in neighborhoods where you have some of uh, walk-up apartments, so other neighborhood scale, higher energy typologies, um, that kind of language effectively washes it out if you want to try to gain the variances or challenge the zoning bylaw, uh, amend the zoning bylaw uh, to allow those types of uses, which would be required in the zoning provisions. Now, uh, this is this is the type of uh, use I, I write about in my chapter of the book: walk-up apartments, um, uh, purpose-built rental, uh, purpose-built multi-residential at a neighborhood scale. These each occupy uh, a lot area built into either two or three houses, and they allow for 
seven, 18, 20, 20 odd units uh, in that space. Now, you can, well, I'll get to the affordability part of it afterwards, but this is what I mean by the uh, zoning bylaw. It doesn't allow for the form that has historically made the use feasible. The block apartment um, would be permitted use in the R zone, but the block apartment uh, to actually make it work pretty much requires building up a lot. They extend typically. If they, if they can have that scale at street level, it doesn't extend all the way back. Then we have to have a lot of block coverage. This far exceeds what we permitted uh, in, the, in the zoning bylaw. Uh, uh, an apartment has a 14 meter building depth permission uh, in, in the R zone, 17 meters for our house. That's 27 meters. These are each exceeding 20. You have density uh, allowances of 0.6 and 1, and these typically are 1.5 and 2. Um, but I want to move on from that to speak to some reasons for unlocking the yellow belt. This is a map from the, uh, a study looking at air pollution, uh, traffic related air pollution uh, in the city. It was studied for the Medical Officer of Health uh, back in 2017. Um, and we looked at the exposure zones. Uh, the quote from the study was, uh, studies show that people living close to roads are more likely to experience adverse health outcomes, including breathing problems, heart disease, cancer, premature death. So we have an official plan and framework that uh, guides growth towards centers, avenues, and downtown, about 5% of the total land area of the city, um, and protects the broader area of neighborhoods as a state. So these are the avenues. You're directing growth to the areas that are one of the higher exposure zones for those traffic-related air pollution. If you want to know what falls in between those exposure zones, it's the neighborhoods that are projected as stable. Um, those are the areas where it is more difficult to put more people. <laughs> now, another reason is just accessibility and quality of life on those streets. You can have quality of life in any environment, in any building form. But I'll say this, I'm fortunate enough to rent yeah, in a house on a street like this. This is my daughter walking to school. I'm able to let my kids get picked up by friends on the way to school and, and walk off on their own, or kick it off the street and walk to the park, or to take their scooter and chalk and go out to play because the street pretty much functions as a park in and of itself. While appreciating that avenues need to intensify, if that were the only option and if that were where I lived on Baptist St. Clair for the avenue closest to me, that would be different. Um, and that isn't something that only people who can afford $2 million homes should have access to going forward, because that is where this is going. Now, speaking about allowing more people into neighborhoods, the reality of what has happened over time, and in nearer term as well, is that a lot of the neighborhoods, and be mindful that when we talk about neighborhoods, we're talking about the interior residential streets, excluding arterials. Um, those are residential, those are, those are zones that fall inside, those are the avenues. Uh, so these are census tracts, population change, uh, 71 to 2016. Um, you see large scale loss of population through the older central areas of Toronto, through the older neighborhoods, if you were to exclude any growth that took place on the arterials from that, the actual population loss in the neighborhoods would be greater. This is the baby boom moving out of their homes, moving out into the suburbs as they were growing. Uh, this is uh, divided homes and rooming houses being converted back into single family homes, which we've all seen take place in residential areas uh, as gentrification has taken place. Um, this is the last 10 years. So the patterns changed. But now we're seeing similar patterns and similar loss of population take place in census tracts and in neighborhoods uh, across the, the inner suburbs, as well as continuing in certain parts of the, of the more central residential neighborhoods. I want to zoom in on my neighborhood. And this is near Baptist and St. Clair. These are four census tracts founded by Vaughn Road, Bathurst to the east, uh, Oakwood to the west, going down to uh, Davenport. Um, so this is the population change over since 71. Uh, since the peak population in the area, these four census tracts have uh, <coughs> today about 5,000 fewer people. Were you to <coughs> exclude the arterial where there are some new condos in Madison St. Clair, that number would probably be closer to 6,000. This is the land use uh, or the zoning uh, in the area. It's, uh, it's 
Rn to the north and it's R to the south. Uh, so these are the more permissive uh, zoning categories. And the areas have been <coughs> study, and uh, there has been condo development at Madison St. Clair, and there are mid rides <coughs> built along St. Clair West in line with that. So I want to look uh, at a street that was uh, tweeting about over the weekend, uh, Witchwood Avenue. Um, in this area as a whole, there are triplexes, there are walk up apartments, there are various uh, missing middle technologies. So, this is Witchwood Avenue. It's a street that has about a dozen triplexes, it has two walk up apartments, it has about 150 house lots, including those triplexes. And those missing middle technologies add about 90 units uh, on the whole, on the site, on the area of about 17 houses. Um, the one walk up alone, bumps the unit density of the street by about 25%. One walk up along those three blocks of Witchwood Avenue. Now, today, um, even though this is the Arden Zone, and even though there is this history of these kinds of uses here, the street is zoned only allowed two dwelling units per lot. And were you to try to push against that, you would likely run up against the stable physical character uh, language of the official plan. This is south in the R zone. This is my street, uh, across the street. So this can happen all day, every day, neighborhoods across the city. You can take down the bungalow and put up a two and a half story big stone chateau with a sunken garage, um, but you can't build a triplex. You can do this on the street. And when we talk about are the impacts minor uh, uh, or a variance, we don't talk about the spillover economic impact of turning a house into a $2.2 .2 million home and what the kind of gravity of that is for the street and what work pulls that street. So these had to have variances for height, for depth, for density. Um, but trying to get those same variances to go deeper and to build a walk up apartment on those two lots and see how far you get. This is Witchwood Avenue, property values. I've had to plot it every sale on that street over the last 15 years. Um, Followed by 300, 400% increase in sales prices. The point I want to make here is that we often talk that if we upfill neighborhoods, they'll become unaffordable. And I would be here to say that that ship has sailed. It's, it's gone. And obviously, central to Toronto neighborhoods are more extreme than the periphery, but it's happening there too. We had, I think we had our street party this weekend, and it's a real mix of people on that street all walks of life, all income types, all ages, but that's a representation of people who got into that neighborhood here. Or people who got into the neighborhood here when the houses were $50,000 or $100,000 or $200,000. But the reality is every home that's changed over the last few years is up here. It's people who can cross a one and a half million and two million dollar threshold. And going forward, that's what the neighborhood turns over and that's what the neighborhood becomes. So we have a mental image of our neighborhoods as something that is already dead and gone. What we have to be looking at is what the neighborhood is becoming and think what steps we need to take if we want these neighborhoods to remain economically accessible to a broad range of households. And that means finding ways to incorporate uh, purpose-built rentals in these neighborhoods because a $2,000 apartment can be rented, but the cost of access to those houses is having to be carried five, six thousand dollars a month. So I want to skip these numbers quickly this just looks at average housing prices and median incomes and what carries what. Um, point being, and I'll connect in the next slide, is this. 80% of the land in Toronto, 80% of the land for mid residential is neighborhoods, is zoned for low-rise residential. Whether we are quite there or not, or whether we get there in a year or two, houses, which is the predominant use, and predominant use to be allowed in those areas, it's like an entry point of about a million dollars. 8.7% of households in Toronto have sufficient income to carry that at 30% of their before tax households. So we're saying that 80% of the land is being set up to be accessible within the CMHC definition of housing need and, uh, and housing affordability uh, going forward. So there's two slides left. This is Toronto's growth. Um, I would say part of it is that Toronto is a city that's growing really quickly. Um, 
we think that's kind of this mature, built out city in the region. But in reality, I mean, when I grew up, a lot of the cities were still green fields. And I'm, I'm a kid of the 70s. Post war, Toronto grew extraordinarily quickly. And I think that it hasn't quite grasped the change that has happened in it. It really <coughs> hasn't been the last 10, 15 years. It still thinks it is something that is no longer. Um, I, I kind of think about it in terms of uh, Bruce Willis' character in Sixth Sense. It, it has to come to terms with the fact that the old city is dead. Uh, and we haven't seen the movie, so I must close that. So this is the final slide. Uh, I think also that we talked about a lot of issues here that are related, um, but that are different. And when I talk about this, um, I often talk about housing affordability, but I don't talk about affordable housing, because I think that's a different thing. Um, that's <coughs> its own and an important issue. It has to happen at the ground level to this. Um, senior level government, or old level government, have stepped away from that. We haven't built affordable housing on mass in decades at scale. And deeply affordable housing won't come out of these neighborhoods. neighborhoods. That's uh, a different discussion. But this is about making neighborhoods more inclusive and more accessible to a broader range of economic households looking forward um, as we kind of look at that chart and where it leads us. Thank you. Thanks to the TSA for the invitation and to Coach House for publishing this book, which was being an interesting and timely discussion. And thanks also to the Indigenous communities who continue to share the territory of the dish with the ones who welcome. It's an honor to work and continue to contribute in the cultural life of this territory. So, how's divided? How the missing middle can solve Toronto's affordability crisis? I struggle with the subtitle of this book. I, I was one of four co-editors, Alex Zikovic, Cheryl Case, John Lawrence, and myself. Um, this photo, which I'm going to start with, which I just love, because it's a view of Page, um, now the, the um, realtor, but they built this house in one day. It, it's, date, it's from the city of the Toronto Archives. It's somewhere between 1910 and 1930, judging by the, the dress on the on the um, woman in the photo, I'm guessing it's like 1915. They built a house in one day. Not sold it in one hour or one day. They built the house. So it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, we assembled this collection of essays as a sort of citizen's guide to the missing middle to help start conversations in neighborhoods across the city. As affordability soars, or lack of affordability, and housing becomes more precarious, it's clear we need to rethink our approach to housing. North American cities are really good at building two types of housing, the coveted single-family dwelling, a house, and the market-driven housing that we've sort of come to know, condos. And don't get me wrong, that is a type of housing, but what they really are is pork bellies in the sky, a commodity in the global marketplace which puts tremendous pressure on housing affordability in every city that they land in. What we have lost is everything in between, which prior designing the, the zoning bylaws introduced in the 1950s was driven, had needs driven housing built by owners or a small local builder. If you had an extended family, you built a small walk up. Like the Weinberg apartment building on Dundas and Elizabeth Streets, it's incremental growth. It was built by a um, Jewish newcomer to the city. It housed his extended family. Once they had sort of made their way and moved out, they ended up um, Turning it over, in, it became housing for the local um, Chinatown population. So it's you know this sort of incremental, small-scale development that, that provided the diversity of housing options. What we've ended up with is a pork that is really that is making it really difficult to eat. The book is an attempt to give you tools for for your, uh, more tools for your toolbox. The yellow belt, which Joe eloquently put up there. In Toronto, it represents about 200 square kilometers, twice the size of Manhattan. It is the belt around the city, defined in the city zoning bylaw as the residential detached zone. And what's allowed to be built is a dwelling unit, a detached house. Anything else requires a variance and adds cost and time and possibly intense neighborhood pushback. One of the things that's interesting is this notion of stability. This is up in North York. This is uh, one of these stable neighborhoods. And of course, what we've ended up, um, what 
What's ended up happening is that over, this is 2007, this is 2015. And so what is character and what is stable about this neighborhood? For me, nothing is more contradictory in a stable, in a, in a city of stability. A city is defined by change. So this is sort of a myth, and one of the things that we wanted to get across, the other thing about this is, is that in the 1950s and 60s, this house was about under 1,000 square feet and housed about six people. Now there are over 3,000 square feet and housed two and actually 1.5 children, but I can't figure that So, you know, what this is doing is draining our neighborhoods, right? It's draining our neighborhoods of density. And so we get, well, the impact of that is that schools struggle, libraries struggle, Main Street struggle, and this is, these are areas where we've already spent tax dollars to put these amenities in, and now we struggle to get them back out. Um, and we, um, are in a constant sort of, you know, closing one school out in another one part of the city and trying to desperately build it in a place where we've built condos. So this is in Vancouver. <coughs> My portion of the book, I sort of looked at other cities, what other cities are doing. This is a corner in Vancouver in 2019, uh, 20, 2009, this is 2015. And this is when the neighborhood in uh, Cedar Cottage, Kensington Cedar Cottage, sort of pushed back against um, the affordability issue. They wanted to, their Main Street was dying, their library was closing, they wanted to get more people into the neighborhood. So they rewrote, uh, they wrote a new zoning bylaw called RT10. And RT10 is a small house duplex zone. And on the lot in 2007, you saw two houses that housed five people. In 2015, they managed to put seven units, seven houses and one laneway house. There are now 25 people living in that, in that uh, two lots, and 11 of them are kids. Interestingly, it hasn't, um, this is uh, Andy Yansworth, who's a, plan a planner who works out of Bing Tong's office in Vancouver. He looked at upzoning and the impact that it has on housing prices. In everywhere in Vancouver where um, they've done character-based up zoning, the prices have increased. In this one neighborhood where they rewrote the zoning bylaws to actually produce housing that they thought would house new buyers, young families, and um, it allow you to age in place, the, the cost in the uh, neighborhood has actually stayed in line with Vancouver's housing prices, which is not affordable because of other issues in the market. But it's interesting to note that it hasn't tripled like the other character-based neighborhoods, which is interesting. Um, the flag lot that just went by is in Edmonton. Edmonton has started to look at maybe a lot needs to be rethought. The lot is left over from um, the uh, way in which the city, the entire country was surveyed by the English and it, it's a remnant of colonial land division. What the Edmonton lot will allow, us, allow people to do in Edmonton is build a laneway house and sell the lot. So they partition, they sever the lot and they sell it so they get this little pork chop or flag lot. And what that does is allows that to potentially come into the market at a price point that's a bit more affordable. That laneway house was selling for $280,000 in Edmonton. Uh, there were about five other houses in the city of Edmonton at that price point. Laneways in other, in other cities have been incredibly expensive, laneway housing. They're incredibly expensive. They become boutique rentals, and you can't, because you have to um, rent them. You can, you're not allowed to sell them. Toronto, interest is, interestingly, is piloting, a, in their laneway issue, they're piloting 20 houses that will be subsidized at an affordable rental rate. And what that bears out on, it's hard to know, but at least they're acknowledging that the laneway housing is not affordable, which I think is interesting. The other in very interesting thing, which I think is really fascinating, is Seattle right now. Seattle has done a study where they have um, looked at the city, looked at the neighborhoods that are working, and decided that they're going to look at them in terms of their Seattle. And again, this is their uh, uh, 
um, yellow belt map, and these are being produced. A New York Times article just a couple of weeks ago had one. They're being produced everywhere. But Seattle is dealing with it too, and their approach is being to simply look at what works. What do the neighborhoods people like and want? They set up guidelines um, for what their housing as a right strategy was, and they redefine their rules to reflect the reality of the city. And what's really interesting about this is part of the solution is to simply rename single family zoning to neighborhood residential. Because single family zoning is an anomaly. There is no neighborhood in the city that has just single family residential houses. It doesn't exist. And so what they're going, what they're what they're doing is changing to neighborhood residential. They're going to retroactively go back and look at every single form of housing and write zoning bylaws to allow it as an outright form of development. So if there's a three-story walk-up in your neighborhood, it will now be an outright form of development in Seattle. It's a really fascinating approach because it's not saying we're going to try and reinvent the wheel, it's actually really looking at the sort of integrity of the neighborhoods and what makes them work, and actually writing rules that allow that, which is a really fascinating, I think, experiment, and I'm interested to see how that plays out. Um, you know, our hope was that this book would sort of help to um, put the times back into the fork and make it a more useful tool so that, uh, you know, it's not a, it's sort of a, really it's a provocation, the book, and the idea was to just sort of get a bunch of different ideas out there for people to begin thinking about and confronting this issue, because it is a huge issue. The stability and character that we've engendered into our neighborhoods has basically made them exclusive zones. And in the U.S., they deal with that a bit more upfrontly in an upfront manner, because it's actually a racist policy that redlined mortgaging lending opportunities, and in, North, in the rest of North America, it's more class-based, and that is, you know, keeping transients and the poor and newcomers out of your neighborhood, and that is, I think, a little more difficult conversation to take on, but I think that the sort of um, beauty of Toronto neighborhoods is their diversity, and that's what we all love about them, and that's what we should be working towards. And some of the solutions in that book and the conversations that we were hoping to sort of spark are, are written about in there. So thanks. It's, uh, it's interesting. So our contribution to the book was uh, the, the triple duplex uh, project, which kind of tied in, I think, directly in some of the ideas in the book, tying directly to some of the, the work that we've been doing for the past nine years in the office. Uh, some of it speculative, some of it uh, kind of commissions. And so these are a series of the houses that are, and projects that we've done that kind of explore this topic. I think for us, we come at this topic with uh, kind of exploring a, a series of objectives. objectives. I think for us, uh, we're interested in creating architecture that spatially benefits from increased density. So for us, it means, you know, how do we create the architecture that uh, where density is thought after, where the quality of, you know, of these spaces are what people kind of desire in these neighbor kind of residential areas. Uh, the second where you look at is development of new kind of indoor outdoor relationships. So for us, it's kind of moving beyond the idea of the kind of bookended front and backyard <coughs> and kind of symbols of the single family house. Uh, and all of these projects, just because of their density, kind of create a series of new economic models of, uh, and uh, models of ownership. I don't think any of these projects were not we're not producing affordable housing. We understand that, and that's not necessarily the focus of these projects. So when we're producing new ownership models, that's not ownership in the sense of, kind of affordable housing. But so, uh, but it at least allows uh, different types and I think different. 
images of kind of multi generational uh, kind of renter condo uh, kind of uh, situations to happen. Uh, the other one we kind of look at is strategies uh, to kind of create these projects within the residential context that, that they can sit in. So rather kind of more residential neighborhoods. Can I use context in that argument of context? It means the people that uh, I think misuse that, then it helps us to kind of find ways of increasing density in some of these projects. Uh, so this is uh, the plan of, of the neighborhood that we uh, produced this project in. So it was uh, obviously part of this larger uh, series of works that Alex had explored, uh, kind of produced and curated. And he gave us a site on Clinton Street. Uh, and it was, it was kind of one of these guys. And so going back, I think uh, probably everybody else has spoken about these maps of I think a little bit more uh, eloquently than, than we would. I think for us, we started looking at you know the scale of, of these semi-detached houses and how we could kind of develop an argument for uh, kind of increasing exponentially the amount of density uh, just by kind of exploring these types of Kind of planning models. And so here we have a typical semi detached house. Uh, we have kind of 17 feet wide and 30 deep. Uh, so the 17 after, uh, after setbacks ends up being 14, and we're kind of maxing out at the 14 meter or 17 meter uh, allowable distance. So what, what we did is we took uh, the two sites that the semi-detached uh, semi sits on and created uh, two, or created, sorry, three duplexes within it. The middle one is somewhat a duplex, it's kind of a multi-generational house. So we did this by, so we did this by reconfiguring property lines and making one house kind of stretch across the entire uh, width of the two sites, uh, which allowed us to kind of produce a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back organization. Uh, so in here, we kind of see the you know, front of the property, back of the property. We ended up kind of mirroring the front unit around the center one. Over here, you see a series of, of courtyards. Okay, so here's the, the front elevation of the project. So, uh, in front elevation, we kind of disguise the mass of it by, by kind of you know, carrying through a series of data lines that were consistent in the, the context. We also use a series of brick screens, which would allow us to retain the same scale of openings as the neighbors, but allow a kind of much more light into the space. Uh, and the next step for us was to kind of take this exterior space and uh, subdivide the house uh, such that it, it organizes around this large courtyard. So here we use the courtyard as an entry, and these are kind of the entries for the three upper units, the duplexes. So here now landscape for us is kind of enveloped in the house and then allows us to kind of utilize different methods of gradient heating, um, weather, weather curtains kind of closing it down, uh, such that the exterior or the front yard of the house now becomes an additional group to the house. Okay, so here's the, the floor plans. Now I'm going from basement over to the third floor. So the house is, you can see are kind of subdivided by the gray areas of the courtyards, which kind of split, almost recreate the semi-detached, but uh, creating the, the 
kind of attached portion as a large exterior courtyard that the uh, spaces wrap around on the three levels. All the services are stacked against the party walls, back to back to back. Uh, and the rooms on the other floors uh, kind of all radiate around uh, the uh, three story courtyard. Actually, this is the third, that's the second. Uh, basement apartment. So, the basement apartment, we utilized a strategy that we uh, had some success with on our project in Parkdale. So, we carved out a series of entry courtyards that kind of act to mitigate this idea and, and the, uh, the kind of idea of a basement apartment. And so that works along with uh, kind of recessed uh, clear story along certain portions of the sides that bring in uh, light on the sides. So here's an interior rendering of one of the front units uh, looking at, at a way of kind of producing uh, a relationship with the courtyard outside. This one's in the living room, looking back out to the kitchen, dining, and the entry courtyard. work to that book. Um, I haven't read it all yet because there's a lot of interesting ideas in it, kind of kicking it off one at a time. Um, so our studio workshop architecture entered uh, a missing mineral cavity competition um, that was run by Vancouver Urbanarium. Um, the competition's purpose was to generate ideas of how missile, mineral density dwellings can contribute to affordable housing uh, in residential areas zoned solely for single family houses, all that yellow belt that uh, was talking about. So our our uh, proposal built on the success of what you can see here is the Vancouver Special Happy <laughs> Well, what you can see then. I'll just keep going as, as, as strange as that. Um, it's a low cost house design, probably on the reading since the 70s. It really maximized the zoning box and envelope of the area and could have two, have two families in it. Um, this ugly box came to be really loved in Vancouver. It also came to be $2 million housing. <laughs> um, so we really ripped on that. And we looked at um, developing this form, um, increasing its density, flexibility, and sociability uh, to make a housing type that we call extra special. Um, and we, we also kind of looked at not kind of going for the fine materials and everything and kind of making something that similar to that was out of really affordable materials, um, not kind of refined design, and really kind of looking at a dumb box that could house more people. Um, so we see kind of uh, a, a few other things that we, we started with that Vancouver special, but also borrowed from the intergenerational Chinese courtyard home um, and the Brooklyn brownstone. Um, looking at the kind of flexibility that the brownstone had to move seamlessly from a single family home to multiple units and back. So our proposal is a direct response to the zoning in Los Angeles and Burnaby. And so we've asked to bring this into the Toronto context, but it's really hard because we're starting with a very Vancouver specific form that you don't have in Toronto and never developed some, some type of form like that. I would say the triplex is the closest, but it didn't take over full neighborhoods and actually isn't allowed in the current zoning um, like the Vancouver Special. Um, and the lot sizes in Burnaby, where the, the competition site we had, are 33 by 122 feet. Um, so to, to, um, to bring it into the Toronto context, I will kind of talk about how, how some of these ideas are still applicable. Um, we also, in entering this competition, were like, we could have went really radical and drastic, but, uh, but we decided, let's go gentle density. What's the next step that maybe people in the neighborhood would actually accept? 
Um, so uh, we're looking at the current zoning parameters. The one thing we did, if you see the yellow bit, and not the yellow zone here, this is actually our proposal for a new zoning category called Residential Extra, RX, the prescription for more people um, being in the neighborhood. Um, it only applies to the two lots that are adjacent to the corner. Um, if you combine two lots, and they have to be at least 50 feet wide. So in the Toronto context, you have to combine usually at least three lots because, um, because our, our lots are, are much more narrow um, on average. Um, feet wide. Um, and the three reasons for this corner location, as we're saying, kind of build up the idea that you could have um, this gentle density, is that with streets on two sides and a laneway, the corner would allow for easier access to multiple dwellings, direct access. Um, there's only one immediate neighbor, so therefore less NIMBYs <laughs> at the meeting, but also um, <laughs> very little privacy impact on the, the existing dwellings. And as in Burnaby, the lots are oriented north south, there'd be minimal shadow dogs, I know it's always a big thing. Uh, everyone wants to kind of stay in the shade on the patio, but they don't want any shadow. You know, it's kind of a, a move on both sides. So we proposed um, a few changes for these RX zone lots only. Um, an increase in number of dwelling units, um, um, increasing the building area allowed, increasing allowable lot coverage from 40% of people to 55. So it wasn't drastic. We were kind of trying to, to, to be kind of reasonable about these. And increase the number of stories from 2.5 to 3, but actually keeping the height restriction. So it wasn't any taller, and the setbacks were the same. So the building is really kind of the same envelope. It just can house more people. It, it is a little bit bigger on the lot, but it's the kind of thing you don't notice is in the backyard. It's taking a little bit of extra uh, out of the space. Um, one way we did that, and, and similar to, I think, the, the last um, example of like dropping that, that what in the Brooklyn Browns, we call the garden level. They don't call it a basement. It's just dropped a bit on the front. Um, here we have one meter because in Vancouver the cross line is not as low. You don't have to go down as much with, with your footings. Um, so we've dropped it by one meter um, and, and allow for the basement or the, the main floor to kind of be just a little bit underneath, but in the back that it would be at, at the same grade so we could have an acceptable unit. Um, so by doing this, we added um, more flexibility in dwelling type size and ownership op options. Um, and I just wanted to show you, so this is kind of a, a bit of a comparison on um, the Vancouver Special versus what we're doing. We kind of board a lot of things from the first floor overhang, second floor patio spaces for successful elements. Um, we kept the front door and stair configuration, which allowed the top two floors to be either connected into one larger home with maybe two generations of families, but also um, that, um, that you could make them two separate homes um, without any real kind of major um, change um, and, and renovation. Um, a lot of these houses started in the 70s that where people would actually not even finish one of the floors, they would move in and finish only one floor, or they would rent part of it until they eventually moved into the rest of it, and that was kind of, and, and it could be moved back again in the future, so they were quite good. You also find this in what I've just recently, I wish I had a photo of it, I, I thought of it after uh, I had submitted my slides a couple days ago, um, is the Buffalo Double. If anyone's been to Buffalo, I got to stay in one recently. They're 19th century homes that I think act a bit like the Vancouver Special, but they have a beautiful Victorianness so that maybe you convince more people that, that they're wonderful. They have two front doors, which I know on council is a crazy idea. Um, you know, and two front doors on the street. Um, but, and they're easily kind of, um, and some of them actually have one front door, but like immediately into the lobby, there's two front doors behind that. Um, and it's kind of a nice way to kind of be able to have that, that idea. They look like single family, really beautiful big single family homes. So kind of similar idea to Vancouver Special, but maybe not um, uh, as bricky and pretty and all that stuff that we love um, in all stable neighborhoods and, and character. Um, we also look at the brownstone subtle sectional relationships. So I said the stoop um, as, as a shared gathering place, right? Um, the, the photo on the bottom, you can see it's kind of that view from inside on the like basement level, garden level, looking out. But you are a little bit depressed, but it also means you kind of carve out a little bit of space in that front yard for yourself, and people don't feel like like um, you know there, there's kind of uh, some of the other people living in the units don't feel like they can walk right up to your windows, um, and that's a lovely thing that that you get in the brownstone, um, but with a stoop on top. Um, and I'll, uh, another photo, uh, another image shows that. Um, we also looked at the range of unit sizes and combinations um, to provide market choice and ownership options. So um, providing social benefits um, and economic benefit as well. So such as um, you know, ben benefiting from um, these kind of shared uh, co-housing options of elder care, child care, getting shared, 
um, sharing meal prep, things like that. And that stuff is actually really happening already in the Vancouver region where, where housing prices are even more expensive than here, where people are starting to kind of live in more um, co-housing options and co-ops and things like that. Um, we're seeing that. It's also how brownstone, the Chinese courtyard has in Vancouver, special sometimes were being used um, over time. Um, we're also looking at ownership combinations where either um, you could have one multi-generational houses or you could have six owners in, in the same building form. Um, but they would always have to be secondary suites. So you can never build, there's nine units in this, but always three have to be secondary suites, trying to keep that rental um, as a possibility in every case. Um, and in some ways, and I think kind of um, Gil's presentation really showed that, is um, finding uh, options for living in quiet tree-lined streets um, that aren't that, that middle between a house and a condo. Condos aren't on tree lined streets. Um, they're they're um, in the in, in Toronto in, in um, avenues and old industrial areas, things like that. Um, and they're more generous, they have more outdoor space and things like that. So each of the units um, have private and shared outdoor space and multiple ways to connect or divide between units. Um, and so we built a building form as a primary means to answer the competition challenge. Um, but affordability is relative. So these would start at probably minimum half a million dollars if there was no land up, if uplift, no development charges or anything like that and get higher. So it's obviously not affordable, but it's an 800 square foot unit. Um, but many of the winning teams um, and the local teams in Vancouver, I think the conversations were getting more sophisticated there, even politically. Um, they went further by investigating ways to decouple rising land values from home prices. So allowing zoning increases on these stable neighborhoods only for cooperative or nonprofit developments um, so that affordable housing and shared ownership um, models are incentivized. Um, our proposal or proposing shared equity models where the city keeps partial ownership in those upzoning um, so it reduces appreciation on the property sold. So only solutions where affordability is actually looked at in perpetuity and geared to income um, will really keep us having affordable places. If you kind of have affordable things so that right now someone can buy that house and take it off the market, um, you're, you're not creating that affordability over time. Um, and it really needs to be not, um, it needs to be geared to income, not a reduction of market rate, because again, you know that's not affordable for all. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say, um, the urban area who ran this competition took the research from this competition, all the winners, and presented it to many of the municipal planning departments and councils in Greater Vancouver. Um, and the conclusion um, that they found is built form is not enough um, to make affordability over time. Um, and neither is densely alone the answer. And three policy changes they recommended, and a lot of um, Port Coquitlam and a bunch of other municipalities are actually taking this on. Rezone broadly, not in pockets, because you avoid Indianism, but also protect from land speculation long term when you do these. Two, remove barriers to different forms of social organization. So this idea of um, not more than four unrelated people living in a house or like this many families, and these, these kind of rules that we see um, really preventing people from co-living in different ways um, and deciding what a family means. Um, and then three, reduce emphasis on streetscape comparison. So like give peak groups, number of front doors, all, all this stuff, um, and to not worry about like that the character, we saw the characters are changing, so let's not worry about that. So it's time to encourage innovation and design forms that are middle ground between a house and condominium, um, but also to achieve lasting affordability, we need to implement policies that break that unsustainable cycle of land speculation and home ownership. Um, so that's where I'm going to end. Thanks. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to speak about two projects today and tell you a little bit of the lineage of the two projects. And uh, before I do that, before I go into the presentation. I it's worthwhile maybe sharing um, a bit of the story of, of SVN. Because a lot of the story of SVN is the story of uh, my partner, John, and uh, with John Lawrence. Oh, he's in the middle there, and I apologize as well, because this is going to be a little bit like the interview that you gave with us. It just kind of rambles and goes on and on. But somehow he managed to fit it into like four pages, which is five pages, seven pages. It's amazing. <laughs> um, John, uh, for those of you that know him, is uh, an architect, a registered architect and a fellow of the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Planners and the, that kind of dual, um, this, this dual esteemed fellowships kind of speak to, I think, a level of recognition of his approach to practice by both of our large the national level institutions that uh, you know, planners and architects here tonight. Um, and it's kind of best when we're in the same place talking about the issues together. Um, 
my background, uh, and I met John at a table at the uh, Architectural Institute of BC's uh, gala in 1999. My background prior to that was uh, working in, what do we call it, um, urban geography and looking at uh, emerging urban areas around cities in Latin America. And my specific focus at the time was uh, the deregulation around the land sector in Mexico that occurred uh, during the period of the implementation of NAFTA policy in the mid-1990s. So Mexico, as opposed to Canada, where there are really a limited number of types of housing. You know, as architects, we don't talk frequently about ownership. We talk about rental, <coughs> or rental condo. We know the word strata. But we don't talk about tenure as, a, as something we can operate on as architects, something we can change fundamentally. In Mexico, there are multiple forms of communal ownership. The Aido structure that was created in 1917 through the Mexican Constitution of 1917. It's a communal form of ownership where multiple individuals or families own title to land. Up until now, they couldn't freely exchange property, but they held title and they could use it as equity, as collateral to, to invest, to build property, to build wealth. Um, there are other forms like the Comunidad, which are very similar to some of our what we'll call more aggressive land forms, like the, the structures under which certain um, Aboriginal communities still occupy or still exist. There. In Mexico, there's a, a comparable condition. So NAFTA sought to normalize that, liberalize that, and constitute a, a system of um, what we call it land reform that North Americanized, I mean Americanized their, uh, their structures. And it started reducing those forms of ownership. So I was sitting at a table with John Van Oster and his wife, and we're talking about this stuff. And then John stood up to speak, and he spoke about two things. He spoke about um, the greenest building being built anywhere in the world in 19. Was at York University in Canada, it's an extraordinary thing. The York University Computer Science Building, which will well pass now. And there's some remarkable buildings that have been built in Canada and Toronto in the last 20 years. But in 1999, the York University Computer Science Building was an important building, and he was involved in the experiment. Tom Marchex Alliance was involved. And then he stood up and talked about um, Botswana and this community called Old Naledi. And uh, if you've seen a, a longer presentation, some of the ladies will interview you with John. John Lawrence, um, you would have seen some of the discussion of Old Lady. Old Lady was a project that John helped lead. It was a project financed partially by CETA, the Canadian International Development Agency in the 1970s. Uh, John um, sort of gave up architecture, he gave up his, his job at the time working with George Fair Architect. He moved to Botswana, moved with his family to Botswana, and he led a kind of a rethink, a repositioning of how we should approach irregular urban settlements that's more civil, more humane. It's a, a listen first approach to land development and redevelopment, where you don't have to bulldoze and apply a grid and assume that there's one way of building. You can talk to people and understand what the paths of least resistance are. Where can we install our permanent infrastructures? Where are the opportunities to, to create the greatest impact for all um, with the, uh, the, the, the most minimal impact and the negative to the few? Um, the land development plan that occurred out of Old Malay, I haven't gotten my presentation yet, this is why I should apologize for rambling on, but it's important. Um, instead of a grid, it was an almost medieval looking um, sort of sleeving of streets and, and electricity and, uh, and permanent plumbing or sewage infrastructure through this, this uh, favela like Latin term, irregular urban settlement. And the most fundamental change was as opposed to applying a system of regular uh, uh, public built um, cinder block homes of varying sizes to accommodate different sizes of families that would be owned by the government in that case um, and rented then to the occupants of the land who were moved and moved back to the land, um, he proposed and his group proposed to, to create a, a cadastral map of the conditions as they existed, a mapping of what people perceived their property to be. And by creating a cadastral map, it actually allowed them to create a registry that gave ownership of the lands to the occupants of that land. And for the first time, they had access to equity, to collateral, and, uh, and it was a microfinance strategy, or what would now be called a microfinance strategy, put in place to help people finance to live into their own homes. So to jump forward a couple of decades, and Old Unleady is what we would call a kind of middle income, middle class community fairly affluent, it still accommodates a range of tenures and you know, there's rental properties, there's ownership properties in that community, but it's matured, it's evolved, it's changed. Um, so come forward to 2015, where a practice called Planning Alliance and another practice called Regional Architects, another practice, 
and we're trying to set terms in place for how we can run SBN. Um, that SBN came out of a uh, conversation about um, you know, how, do you, how do you put everything in one bucket needed to make it safe? Thinking about land, thinking about subdivision, thinking about surveying, you know, not chains, but in, you know, how you define you know, what, what people are entitled to, um, what everyone's entitled to, all of that. But John kind of challenged me. He said, you know, if we're going to create this firm, I can't do it unless we, um, unless we, we can align on one thing, and that's that, you know, I'm, I'm moving towards another project, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, but I, I need you to agree that we have one mandate and one mission, and that mission is we're going to end poverty. And I, I mean, my response was, I, I, it sounds a little overwhelming. I was such a dick about it, though. I mean, it really was. I was like, what the fuck? Like, I mean, I want to do, I want to do, like, community recreation centers, we're doing some student housing projects, and I know some of our clients are not going to be totally on board. It's going to be tough sell. And um, and John was like, oh, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm going to do something a little bit different then. So I'm going to I'm going to work on ending poverty. And so like that's the backstory to what John will speak to some of you about at some point. And it's important to note that that was a very conscious decision in becoming a developer, and we're going to talk about two firms today, SBN and Parcel Development that it, it's underpinned by the idea that the development of housing that fills in gaps for the missing middle is an important part of a policy mitigation strategy. We're gonna talk about these conversations here, focusing a lot on the, the regulatory aspects of what we do, but those human social aspects of what we do are really profound, in that housing and, and good architecture, a thoughtful approach to land development and infill housing um, at every kind of scale is, is part of a broader strategy as a, as a kind of community of people to alleviate poverty, poverty and alleviate um, a lot of the other social issues that, that are pervasive in our city. SBN isn't 100% um, only invested in alleviating poverty. We also create beautiful spaces and, and beautiful buildings. The parcel developments is something a little bit different. Um, in 2015, as we were going through that transition, uh, we were invited to, to put a piece of land in Jamaica. And um, John, uh, went on our behalf to visit this piece of land. It was a 100, 100 acre site. I was for a Canadian um, investor interested in building affordable ownership development there that was modeled on some of what, I'll show you in a second, in John's pro home idea. It was a project we did uh, financed by Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation in the late 90s, early 2000s. This is uh, some of what he saw and what he brought back to us, what we saw. This is, uh, I would say, typical not of just Jamaica, but of communities throughout the world. It's a hilarious thing that in other places in the world, when people are building housing and or seeking, you know, financing to build housing, they generally only build what they can afford, which is a, a kind of hilarious when you think about it. Um, when, when we talk about affordability, what are the opportunities you have to build and live in what you can afford? In Jamaica, in this community, in Longville, um, the image on the right would be your year one, part one of the process. Year two, maybe uh, your family's growing, or just your, your pool of wealth, and you can afford it, you build a new larger your dwelling, you have children, you add a second story in year three or year four, and by year five, you know, this might be a 25 year cycle, year 25, you've, you've achieved either a sufficient affluence or out of necessity, you've created a dwelling that has secondary suites and other units that allows you to live <coughs> the lifestyle of your choice. Agency is a critical part of what we do. This is the pro bono strategy, part one, part two, part three, stage four, five, and six. This uh, was implemented in part, and this is this is a kit of parts, a modular housing strategy that was developed by the firm, um, Architects Alliance, now SBN, um, that intended to create a, for a, a kit for, for $2,500 in the city of Toronto, including land costs, on a service lot you could build in a day and a single home, small home. Um, and over time, for a similar amount of money, ultimately arriving at a home that was built for just under $50,000, uh, 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 the kind of house that Helena and, and Andrew showed us, and the models are actually defined, but uh, the intent is the same. It was owner built, built as they accrued wealth, built as they could afford it. Just a thought to what kind of income can support a house that, that you built for 2500 or 5000 I mean, it's important to note that delivery costs are deeply meaningful 
and design plays a large role in cost. For a single unit, 175 square feet, you could, and this is $2,002, uh, you could afford to own and live in that dwelling for under for any for annual income, family household income of under fifty thousand dollars. So it may seem inhumane to live in only 175 square feet, but for a lot of people who need to earn under fifteen thousand dollars a year, that's an extraordinary thing to live in on your own. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I think most of you know it. Uh, the constituent elements of you know, what, where we began to, to begin moving this thing into the vertical. About a year after we did the Jamaica study, that same client asked us to come to the Dominican Republic with a small parcel of land um, where he intended to build a vertical condominium under the affordable housing, under the program model. So it was, we're suddenly stuck with this challenge. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. How do you translate pro home into vertical? And the lessons are kind of all embedded here. In the early 90s, I'm sure some of you were involved in the Atari Terry project, what we used to call the West Auckland. Of province, of the project of province, and it was intended to be a largely affordable housing redevelopment of what was the highly intended in the West Islands. Um, ben Ostrom, Garwood Jones, Ben Ostrom, contribution to the, the kind of outcomes of the study were a series of uh, investigations into how to develop flexible vertical housing. Uh, the other ones were pretty straightforward, but the simple innovations that were applied, which all rely on producing five points of architecture, were a relatively open plan, you're minimizing structure. You're not necessarily knockout panels, of course, structure, they're wallings. You're organizing all of the vertical uh, distributions in the building, all the, all the utilities, all the chases, <coughs> the vertical transfer mechanical systems are coming up at the interior corridor, not on the, based on config, final configuration with plumbing and kitchens. The demonstration on the right showing what those occupied floors would look like. And ultimately, the simple structure that, that accommodates that kind of flexibility. If you look at uh, a series of the Balsam to Goes Fire insurance maps, it's a pretty remarkable thing to see how the city of Toronto evolved uh, from the mid 19th century through the mid 20th century. And the small transitions, both in how the form played itself out, but in how things like right of ways introduced themselves into the city. So, comparing Old Melody, where you had to sleep roads through this already dense fabric. Toronto did the same thing, did the same thing over 200 years. We didn't always have 21 meter right of ways. We didn't always have 36 meter right of ways. Um, we didn't always have utility corridors. We had to find split places for that. But prior to that, in the early days of streets like Lippincott, if you live on Lippincott, I just pick on Lippincott because it's the only name I can right now. But Lippincott is you know, a great 19th century street, first, I think, subdivided and created 1870s. If you, if you track Lippincott through the property data maps and now the city of Toronto fire insurance maps, you see an extraordinary evolution. There's never been such thing as, uh, as st like stability, the word invented in the official plan language in the 1990s, has never existed in any neighborhood in the city. Who really doesn't today? And I think everybody's aware of it, and I don't think the city's trying to fight us on that. Or but you have to, the, the biggest challenge is to helping people understand the necessity of evolution over time and the agency of giving. So the recognition we made that kind of combining that idea that neighborhoods are always changing to meet the needs of the families and their residents, and the lessons of the five points of architecture, what's gained from a kind of flexible solution, and the lessons gained from a tar theory, how you organize the vertical circulation to or the vertical distribution to allow for long-term flexibility. We came up with this, this idea called lots. Um, the idea of lots is really translating, the idea, I'll call it uh, the very simple 19th century notion of what a subdivision would look like, Access, servicing, single circulation corridor, lots, the land subdivided into parcels, which had the ability to change, they could shrink, they could grow. There's so few street streets in the city, any part of the city, even, even Don Mills, where the lot width is consistently 45 feet. If you go through the work your neighborhood, every lot is 18, 19, 25.5, 18, 16. And, and the laneways is an amazing amalgam and mess of small consents that led to this incredible fabric we have today. That kind of viability and electricity still exists somewhere, but how do you reproduce that in vertical housing, in the, in the form of vertical housing? So the lots idea, 468 James Street, which is a development that's underway now, it's going to be just selling approved in the city of Hamilton. Um, the zoning, it, or the development is being led by John Van Oster, the parcel developments. SBN is working as the planner or the designer. We were there for the proof of the concept, we're working with the, with the office architecture and the development of the scheme. And what we're trying to do is, is create something that might 
provoke a little bit of a sea change in how vertical housing is built for affordability. For those of you that read the sidewalk, uh, loves uh, all 1,500 pages. You have to read all 1,500 pages to get the point. But um, <laughs> the, the 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 commentary on housing affordability bears some really distinct resemblances to some of the things that the parcel is beginning to explore. And um, I just I, I think that's not to suggest there's any kind of impropriety in those ideas being in the document. I think it speaks to the quality of the ideas. That um, the idea of lots and horizontal flexibility within how a vertical residential housing is built is fundamental. The other aspect that John's exploring and we're exploring through the Four Sixty Eight James Street project is the idea of the unfinished unit. That owners play a role in the finishing of their unit. I, and there's no clear stats on the fundamental difference between what it, if you're buying a condo on spec and the developer delivered on complete versus you buy something as a shell and you finish it yourself, what the savings would be. But the evaluation we're achieving. We're going through in this process, it looks like it would be somewhere in the area of about 10 to 25% of the overall final cost can be saved by allowing them to do the portion of the work. So that raises all sorts of challenges terrain warranty challenges, occupancy challenges, all of those are things we need to overcome. But we're doing that slowly. But taking that approach allows you to envision, a, 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 we'll call it a midterm lifetime of something like this purchasing three lots, which would be three, three strata three separate title parcels in a single three bay unit. The first phase would be building out minimally. You live in a raw unit. You finish your adjacent lot to a higher level of finish so you can rent it out. It's a small unit. It would be rented affordably to a single tenant. Your rental income per year might be five to seven thousand dollars. Over time, maybe it's a couple, maybe they have a child. The rental income continues. They're able to finish their unit with the income they've saved over a number of years from their small secondary suite fit it out on hold, and then over time, as the means allow, as their means allow, they can take over the entirety of the unit and uh, finish it to its complete state. It's a demonstration of the, the variety of units that will likely come in the first phase of the 468 James build-up, and then a preliminary analysis of the levels of affordability that would be achieved with this model. The very top end, with the minimal unit delivered unfinished, accessible, potentially accessible to a family, earning a household income of around $25,000 a year. An image on the, the left by office architecture that shows, you know, if we're not talking about a radical differentiation in terms of building form and topology, all of the innovations interior and demonstration of the, the lots built out on the floor plate of 468 James. The second project, I'll go through this quickly because I've already talked about it a little bit twice my length, is a project that looks at the other end of, of, uh, of the generation life cycle. What happens when seniors move into a fixed income, um, the other end of affordability. Um, so try to find ways of staying in community or in situ in order to live out the latter part of their lives. We were uh, retained by a, a, a national charity called St. Elizabeth, Elizabeth's Healthcare. Some of you might know them, the largest provider of in home healthcare to seniors in the country. Um, they employ about 17,000 people all over across the country. It's very large out west in Vancouver and Victoria. And they're beginning to envision a transition to a, um, a housing model. That extends their healthcare programming, focusing on wellness into the senior space. And we, we were asked to look at their problem, not necessarily as a building, but as an idea, a program. And so, what, what they found is the biggest challenge that any anyone to, needs to overcome moving from a single family home they want to rent into a any kind of vertical or multi residential housing is, is taking the idea of home and translating some of the amenity provided by home ownership. In the, in the kinds of conditions we were talking about before, the park-like neighborhood conditions. And then imagine that translated into a vertical community that makes these kind of places not just a kind of spinal acra of what they came from, but maybe a, a kind of consolidated um, set of the, the kind of strongest and most valuable amenities anyone could have existed, encountered in their own neighborhood. Um, so the, uh, we're doing it at the neighborhood scale. That was the first thought to bring back SEH and the second thought we have is let's do it at the house scale too and break down all the constituent parts into elements of what might be, we'll call it the affordability strategy, which in this case was a co-live model, which there's lots of interesting providers coming into that space in Canada and now looking at ways of delivering a kind of co-live typology for seniors. I think companies like Abbey Fields or Carpe Diem Suites in Vancouver. And this is the whole package pulled together, how all those amenities fit into the whole and the thinking in this is that this is your typical Co-live suite, 
you're consolidating a collective living space for 12 individuals or 12 couples, so 24 individuals living in a single floor plate in the space of about sort of three condominium units, then the similar floor plate um, would, would, would house somewhere between, say, three to three to 12 to 15 large families living in those condominiums, but uh, at a much higher kind of ownership or rental rate in this situation. Although the floor is rent at a very high rate, the affordability because of the size of the unit and the fact that you're sharing the rental for the common living uh, space ends up being about half what it would be if it was a rental apartment building. And a view of what that might look like. Thanks. I'm very excited to show you. So I only sent one slide and they didn't get it. Um, there it is. That's my slide. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for staying. Um, I want to begin with, with two quick sort of apologia. Uh, first of all, um, uh, despite anything I might say from here on, I do like the idea of a mix of housing types in neighborhoods. So just bear that in mind, despite anything else you might hear. Uh, the second is, um, John it, and I have been friends for 40 years, and I, you know, when I read the book, I said to John, John, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure you want me on a panel about this book, and he said, Gord, this is to start a conversation. Okay? So with those two pieces of apology of mine, <laughs> let's begin. So if you'll open your texts <laughs> to page 193. Um, this is uh, a piece Alex wrote, and I'm really sad Alex isn't here. I'm tired of fighting with him on Twitter. I wanted to do it in person. Um, it's the one uh, about the cost of the box, right? And it's the one, I, I chose this one because it's the one that does the deepest dive into the money, right? And the subtitle of the book is about affordable housing in the city. All about affordable housing. So this is the one that actually gives a business case, and it uh, looks at a property in Scarborough that's currently a bungalow and says, if we built out, ignoring the city of Toronto's zoning bylaws, because the city of Toronto is always wrong, um, we could get uh, eight units on that one lot that uh, could accommodate a family. And he looks at the uh, cost of the application fees, he looks at the cost of construction, he looks at all of that kind of stuff. And he winds up with eight units that you could sell for $700,000. And he says, the big problem here is that the City of Toronto uh, requires development charges of about 40, well, 40, 50,000 uh, per unit, uh, that we require money for parkland, and that we charge money to review the application for a total of $600,000 or about 12% of the cost of the project. He then says that about half the cost of the project would be construction. The other 38, 40% is the land cost, the financing cost, the transaction costs, and the mortgaging costs. It's the finances behind housing. So I, I want you to just put out your mind for a minute whether or not you think this stuff is good, and let's think about the one model that's been produced, $700,000 a unit. At $700,000 a unit, uh, if you're following the current mortgage stress test, that's $150,000 now, okay? I, I'm 55, I still don't have it. I do own a house, but I never would have had $150,000 to do it. To make the monthly payment, it would be about $4,000. $4,000 a month to carry that size 550 mortgage, right? To do that, your household income would have to be about $150,000 a year. Family income, $150,000 a year. $150,000 a year is in the top 20% of incomes in Canada. So the business case 
for an ideal circumstance for intensifying and taking one unit and turning it into eight in the city of Toronto means that we would be building housing for the top 20% of incomes in the city of Toronto. It is never going to be a politically successful project, okay, under certain circumstances. I want to interrogate, though, why is someone who worked in the environmental movement making a lot less than $150,000 a year wound up owning a home in the city of Toronto, and why I couldn't possibly do it now? There are two principal pieces of economic theory that we need to know. The first has to do with the financialization of housing. Now, financialization is a term that many people define differently, but I, I have uh, two quick pathways to understand. The first is, in 1970, about 10% of the GNP was tied in North America, was tied to people uh, buying financial instruments, issuing debt, uh, speculating on currency, uh, uh, buying uh, selling a mortgage to somebody. In other words, having a transaction was money making money off of money. And about 30% of the GNP in North America was people investing in making things. Okay? In 2010, 10% of the investment in North America was people making things. And 20% of the GNP in North America was people making money off money. So essentially, between when my parents bought their house and when I had, uh, when my kids were old enough to move out of home, we moved from an economy where the wealthy were investing in manufacturing and creating jobs and doing all that kind of stuff to an economy where the wealthy made money by lending money. And it's had a profound impact on the housing market. If you are a person who makes your money by lending money, you are now making money off the rent or the mortgage that someone lives in. The largest single financial object Human history is our current global real estate market. It's $170 trillion. It's about half of all wealth in the world. And if you invest for a living, you are investing in buying up land and charging rent on it, either in the form of direct rent or in the form of a mortgage. People if, who build houses, it is in our economy, the house or the apartment is no longer the product, the mortgage. Is the product. That's what financialization is. Okay? And its impacts on the Toronto housing market are something we need to be very mindful of. And it's the reason that change over a couple of generations is the reason that the uh, homeowners, that the authors of this book seem to have a bit of a beef with, who are close in age to me, uh, are sitting in a house and the people who are 30 never will. It is because of that change in our economy, the financialization of our economy. The second uh, large economic thing you need to be aware of uh, is, has to do with inequality. And probably the most important book on economics written in the last 40 or 50 years was written by Thomas Piketty. It's called Capital in the 21st Century. And what he looks at is the entire history of all income tax receipts ever collected by any government anywhere. And he notices a couple of things. The first thing he notices is that with one exception, it has always been true that the rate of return on investment is greater than the rate of the growth of the economy. In other words, if you are someone who has money and you are investing it, say in holding a mortgage for someone or in a real estate income trust that is buying up uh, apartment buildings, 
or in asset-backed commercial paper, paper, which bundles mortgages together and generates a revenue stream. If you are doing that, you are getting money back faster than the economy grows. As long as that is true, what happens is the portion of wealth that the people who have wealth grows and the portion of wealth that we get paid for working shrinks, right? So we start off with wealth and the rate of return is greater than the rate of economic growth, you wind up owning a larger share of the economy. If you start off working for a living and the rate of return is greater than the rate of economic growth, you wind up paying more and more and more for housing. A simple way of understanding this is in the 70s, uh, it, typically the portion of your income that you would spend on housing would be between 20 and 25%. Currently, it's between, depending on where you are on the income scale, it's usually over 40, sometimes approaching that is not because the cost of construction has gone up. It is not because the uh, fees that the city of Toronto or any other municipality charges for the infrastructure to support new housing has gone up. It is not because the land use uh, designations have become more restricted. It is because when you move into a home, you have not got the wealth to pay for it in advance you have to borrow that either through a mortgage or by paying rent to somebody. And the amount of hours that you have to work to pay that is greater than it used to be because the concentration of wealth in our society is greater and competition to get a house means that you have to work longer hours to pay those wealthy people for your right to live. That's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that in parts of the world, and the book does talk about a couple of them, like Vienna or in Berlin. Uh, Berlin just last week passed a regulation there will be no rent increase for five years. Um, or Stockholm or Glasgow or Paris, not the suburbs. Um, in those areas, uh, close to or often more than half of all housing is socially owned. It's owned through co-ops, it's owned directly by governments, it's provided by not-for-profits. Sometimes, say in the model of Glasgow, uh, you have all three, but it's permeable. You can move from the co-op to the not-for-profit to uh, the government-owned housing, and you never know which one you're in. But the, the, the back of office between the co-ops and the not-for-profit takes care of all that. Now, in that circumstance, instead of paying the exchange value for what the guy who owns the land, or owns your mortgage, or owns your second mortgage, or owns the real estate income trust that bought your building, instead of paying them 15% of all the wages that you earn, you are paying it back into the government or the not-for-profit. And instead of the wealth created by people who work and are trying to pay for a home in the city of Toronto, disappearing out of the Toronto housing market and going to wherever the rate of return is good, maybe it's an oil well in Saudi Arabia, maybe it's a bauxite mine in Jamaica, maybe it's housing in Bhutan. Instead of it flying out of our market, that wealth is stays here and it provides the next affordable housing unit. So the thing I wanted to have you to have in your minds when, when we're thinking about how to get uh, more diverse housing forms in our neighborhoods is that the private market will never accomplish any of the very pretty pictures that you saw now, there was a time 
after World War II up to about 1975, when because the depression wiped out the wealth and because governments said to the wealthy, you're just paying for the war and we're not paying you back, the concentration of wealth that could sit on you as you were trying to pay for your house didn't exist. So Canadians and Americans have this crazy notion that has never been true in human history, that we can all work for a few years, get a down payment, buy a nice house in a nice neighborhood, and then our kids will be able to do it too, and so on and so on. That model of housing, which is unique to Canada and the United States, has only ever existed once and in one place. Here, from World War II, until about 1975 and we're laboring under a delusion if we think that that unique economic circumstance when there was no financialization and when the concentration of wealth hadn't hit the levels we're at now which are by the way almost as bad as they were in 1890 um, if we're laboring under an illusion that we can continue to reproduce home ownership or that we can have the private market generate rental that's affordable for people who are not in the top 20%, for people who are in the bottom 20%, or in the next 20%, or the 20% after that, or the 20% after that. In other words, the working and middle class. So, as nice as the pictures were, you will not get that. The course we are on is actually Jane Austen. We all remember Sense and Sensibility, how wonderful it was that uh, Mr. Darcy had 5,000 a year. Remember? Y'all were talking about how much they had a year. What was that 5,000 generated by? Renting land. I think I'll stop.